Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. Uh, do you want this fate point uh, to start giggling through the entire recording? <laughs> Um, are are you are you activating my trouble aspect? <laughs> Only because it's on topic. Cue <laughs> music. Welcome to another episode of Pants Talking Games. I'm one of your hosts with all the fate points, Phil. And I am your host with all of the trouble aspects, Senda. All right, Senda, what do we got for tonight's topic? Well, tonight's topic comes to us from John in the forums who asked, There are a number of games that provide some sort of resource or currency for players when they make an in-character decision or action that fits their character but makes their life harder or the situation more interesting. Also, when a GM encourages a character to act in a certain way, perhaps due to a flaw or trait, or the case of a GM intrusions where a player or character gets rewarded when the GM makes the situation more difficult. Thinking of games like Fate, Cypher System, Burning Wheel, etc. as matching some or all of these. Sometimes these decisions slash intrusions impact more than just the character getting rewarded, though. They might derail a goal for the entire table, for instance. This can cause frustration. How would you handle these situations as a player or a GM? Or is this a symptom of a mismatch between player preferences and game style? All right, John, great topic. Thanks for putting it up in the forum. So, what we're talking about here is actually something called transactional complications. And uh, we actually recently did a Misdirected Mark episode um, on the mechanics of transactional complications. So uh, check out episode 381 if you want to hear more about how the me- these mechanics work. So if you're not familiar with these mechanics, we get super nerdy about breaking down how the mechanics actually work uh, inside the game. But yeah, you did. <laughs> that is uh, that is the misdirected mark. What are we doing here tonight? So for tonight, we're going to talk about how to play with this mechanic actually in your game. And I am going to talk about it from the player side. I'm going to talk about it from the GM side. Awesome. So first, Phil, Definition Panda, can you give us a bit of a refresher on transactional complications? Yeah. So I'll just give you the really short version of this, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to break this thing into two parts, right? Complications are a difficulty. Transactional is an exchange or payment. In tabletop RPGs, what we mean by transactional complications is that there is a mechanism by which the GM can create a complication for the players in the narrative. And in return, the player is rewarded with an in-game currency or some other kind of token uh, that can be spent at another time. Um, Mm -hmm. The best example of this and the easiest one, because it's the only one we're going to use for tonight, is the Fate Compel. So a Compel is when the GM uses one of the aspects, typically the character's trouble aspect, although it does not have to be. It can be one of the character's other aspects, and sometimes it can even be an aspect in the room. Right. But but as long as it's tied to whatever the situation is. Like I said, most times you go, the uh, GM will lean on a character's trouble. Okay. Um, so for instance, a character may have a trouble aspect of can't keep my mouth shut. That's a good one, right? That's um. Uh-huh. That's a lot of fun for trouble aspect. <laughs> Um, okay, so then we're going to kind of just break this down and kind of talk about the transaction part and the complication part in uh, by going through like how this mechanic plays. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Cool. I'm going to set up a scene here, right? Um, our party, of which I'm going to be a member, is in the middle of a difficult negotiation. And you, Senda the GM, might do something like this. Right. So as you're sitting here in this fierce negotiation with Baron Almut, you realize that he has like, he's just got a little thing, like a little green thing. It's stuck in his teeth right up in front, right in the middle where it's really obvious. So like the whole time he's talking, like yeah, you can see it. You can see it every time. And so I'm just going to slide this fate point across the table to you. Isn't, isn't that driving you wild? Okay. So there's the transaction part. Yep. Right. So the transaction part is I'm going to get a fate point. Yep. If I complicate the scene by um, using my aspect can't keep my mouth shut. So mm-hmm. what you're buying here is that I'm going to not keep my mouth shut. Right. Okay. 
So, so cool. and, and to make it super clear, maybe I maybe I would slide it across and say something more like, isn't that driving you wild? Wouldn't it be funny if you told your friends about it or something like that, right? Sure. Or do you want to say something? Are you right? going to tell him? Yep. Right. Like <laughs> Now, depending on how well we know each other and depending on the fact that I pretty much know you're going after my can't keep my mouth shut aspect at this point, I'm going to just take the fate point, right? So I slide the fate point over to me because I need fate points. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm like, it is. And I stand up and I say, if you're going to keep trying to extort us, the least you could do is provide some salad for the rest of us. (laughs) Sorry, it was funny. Now, clearly, we have complicated the situation, right? right? Like, this negotiation has gotten far more tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... And it's complicated it not just for Phil's character, but for everyone in the party, right? And that could cause some strain if it wasn't handled properly. So some of this needs to actually be handled during session zero because it's an expectations thing. Yeah. Now, when I say session zero, I'm talking about like campaign session zero, but I will say that it also applies to the first few minutes if you are running a con game and you are explaining things. Agreed. So I have had to do this a lot when I explain fate yep. to people who have never played it, like how compels work. Um, but we're just, uh, we'll stick with the session zero. So during session zero, you need to talk to your group about this mechanic and you got it. You should discuss how it's going to work in the game, right. especially. Especially if you are if you are new to having transactional complications in a game. Right. So you need to talk about the kinds of complications you expect to bring up in play um, and have you know, like you can actually give people examples and stuff even so that people understand what it's going to sound like and what it means and, you know doesn't get angry about it basically <laughs> right and and you're and the, depending on the game you're playing there may be some rules for how the transaction complication uh, not only works but what it is allowed to do and what it's not allowed to do yes but if there's any um, even even re- even reviewing that is good but if there's any gray areas going over it plus going over your own GM preferences for it are really good so like for instance like I might say if I was a GM right like no complication is going to undo a success or negate any progress you've made right. right so anything you've like any successes you've gotten anything you've done up to this part no complication automatically und- undoes that because that's um, that well it's sucks. just kind of a dick move yeah right? that's a dick <laughs> like, move yeah. that's a that's a rocks fall you die kind of like haha I'm yeah. just going to take all of this away from you kind of don't right that's mean now now my complications may require you to make additional checks Mm -hmm. or there may be some tangential consequences right like i I won't undo your success but i may tack a consequence onto the side of it right yeah okay and that makes sense yeah it totally does i mean so you can make it in in powered by the apocalypse terms you can take it from a full success to a success with a complication basically right uh yeah if there was a game that had a compel for that that's actually really interesting but let's not let's not delve too yeah deep we, we won't delve too deep on it but it, it would be in, anyway um but so the other thing that we would recommend talking about in advance when you're setting expectations is to talk about the frequency with which compels or uh, you know that transactional um complication will come up at the table during the game yeah so like for fate the compels actually a pretty integral part of the game because it is what fuels the fate point economy. Like a GM is actually like encouraged to, especially when players start to run low on fate points, a GM is actually encouraged to compel like players to keep things moving. So if we're playing a, um, if we're playing a fate game, you can pretty much expect I'm going to at least minimally, at least once a session, I'm going to try to compel you into something. Yeah. But probably, I mean, having played fate with you, Usually more. Right? Probably more. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if we're playing a one shot, because right. then it's probably a lot. Then more. a lot. Yeah. Because just yeah. hit on all that stuff as fast as you can and, yeah. or a lot. Right. So you also need to establish trust with the players that you're not going to be malicious about how you use these compels, that you are, in fact, working together at the table to, to, to create this story and that you're using the compels to make the game more interesting or more exciting and not to just be like, ha ha, you were trying to do the thing and you don't succeed, right? Yeah, and I think this one's, I think this one is crucial 
for when you are when you are transitioning players from more traditional games I agree yeah. into into games that have these kinds of mechanics because this is the kind of mechanic that players from traditional games are like what like right. why would I ever why would I ever let the GM mess something up yes. you know yeah. <laughs> like, it will, but, because and and it, and it comes it it you have to break away from the stereotype of the adversarial GM for this kind of yep. play to work in any way shape or form right yeah, exactly. All right, so cool. Um, that's a quick, brief overview of um, of the um, mechanics and a little bit about setting things up in Session Zero, which I do think is actually uh, crucial. Yes. Uh, so now, uh, let's talk about some tips for making this mechanic work in, uh, in play first from the player side, and then after that, we'll jump over to the GM side. Right. So when you are the player... As the recipient of a transactional complication, here are some tips for how to help the GM and the game along, right? The first one is pretty much what we were just talking about, which is trust the GM, right? If the proper session zero discussion has been had and that GM has told you, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to murder you with this compel or whatever it is, right? Like I'm not going to compel you to leap off a cliff, then you need to actually trust the GM that they really are using this to make the game more interesting. So, I mean, unless there's a good reason not to, that you really don't want to, my tip is like, you know, 90, 95% of the time, take the compel. It'll yeah, be more fun. Take the compel. <laughs> some of this is going to be like a leap of faith because like if you're yeah. just trying this game for a first time or you've gone to a con game and you're like, well, I've never played Fate before. I'm going to sit down and play. Um, what's this compel thing? Like, Take a leap of faith on this, right? Trust the GM. Now, if you have a GM that is abusing the compel, yeah, that sucks. my advice is go play another game. Yeah, don't play like with Like either that GM. don't play with that GM or convince that GM to go back to running something yeah. um, that's a little more traditional. Yeah, because they're, um, then they're, they're not actually running the game right at that point. Yeah, they're just, I, I, they're would, missing I would kind say of, they're missing the, the, the point, right? And the, the, the social contract that goes with playing a game like this where you should be you should feel safe to take the compel knowing that it's going to cause complications and interesting things but not that it's going to be like haha you took the compel now you're all dead yes right? exactly <laughs> yeah and, and and most nearly every game that has transactional complications pretty much spells that out yes like cipher system like yep. all of them pretty much spell pretty out clear. like don't be a dick with this mechanic. So trust your GM. If your GM's a, a good enough person or at least sticks to the rules of the game, you're probably okay. And if your GM's abusing this, get out. Just leave. Yeah, you don't okay. you don't have to finish that game. It's fine. What's your next bit of advice? Right. Um, don't overdo it. So when you accept the compel, take an action that is in the spirit of what the GM is looking for, but don't go so far over the top that the scene escalates into something different different that they may not have intended right right so like don't like going back to our our baron with the green the, the green leaf in his mouth don't when you accept the compel decide that you're going to take the green leaf out with the tip of your rapier right you know like leaping across left the table little. like here use this as a toothpick you know that ugh. you've left very little room for anything else to happen in the scene once you've drawn your rapier and stuck the tip of it in the baron's face right like yes. the only thing left is that this is going to go into some sort of combat yes <laughs> And and the GM will be utterly horrified yeah, because we'll be like, oh, what was no. supposed to be funny, oh, no. which was which was like you're trying to get your character to not, you know, screw up the situation by being rude, has now turned into a full on rolling fight. Right, which is probably we've, we've not lost, at all what they intended. We've lost everything that we were intending here. <laughs> Right. Um, so another thing you can do with compels that's very cool is pull in some other players, right? Because it might be your complication, but you can share the drama of that compel by including other people in the scene or in the actions that you're doing um, as a result of accepting that compel. Yeah. So going back to that same situation with the Baron, if I'm the player, I don't actually have to confront the Baron outright to to. Uh, not be able to shut my stupid mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, I might just lean over to one of the other players and start like rudely whispering about the Baron and like pointing to the front of my you know mouth and like, pointing at you, the Baron and did whispering. You see that? Do you right. see that? Like, what do you, do you think see he it? Had do you see it? Right. It's exactly. huge. Yeah. 
Is that his tooth? <laughs> right. The other player can get in on some of the action. But what? Else, but the other thing it does, which is kind of good for the GM, is that you've also given the GM a little latitude for, since you did not make it directly confrontational, the GM can kind of gauge the right beat to engage the complication, right? Like, uh, but, but pulling in other players is good too, because um, then it's not just on you. Right. Um, yeah. Then ever more people are involved. Which is always right, good. and other players may try to help out the situation. Like yes. somebody might try to cast like, silence shh, on shh, you, shh, right? Like, shh. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Shh, shh, shh. I know, just shh. <laughs> exactly. Right, um, and then the last tip that we had is sometimes it is okay to say no. Right. So many of these mechanisms in many of these games have a way that you can basically say no to a complication. Right. You may have to spend something back or whatever, but it is okay when you feel like your narrative stakes are really high and you just really want this to succeed without complicating things. It's okay to say no, right? Like that that's why those mechanics are there um, so that you can basically consent to the complications and you don't have to, right? But if, yeah, you, there are... if you buy out every single complication, right, if you're like, no, 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 well, two things will happen. If we're talking about fate, eventually you won't be able to anymore, and then you'll have to take whatever comes at Correct. you. And the other thing that will happen is, like, it's boring. Yeah. And and so we're going to talk about some – we're going to talk a little bit about this in just a second when we flip over to the GM side. But sometimes it's okay to say no if the timing's wrong. Right. Like, GMs are not infallible. Mm -mm. They may throw a complication in at a point where you're like, oh, no, no. nothing can go wrong right now. Like, I want this to happen. And maybe the GM isn't even reading it right. So, for instance, let's just do a thing where, hypothetically, you have wooed your 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 sword lesbian has wooed this has wooed this princess. Damn right she has. (laughs) Right. And... um, and you're walking like you're walking along like you're walking along the city by the fountains and the GM is like, oh, this seems like a perfect place to drop in a complication to make you look clumsy or foolish or something like that. I'm going to take advantage of your trouble aspect of like, you know, um, sweaty palms. Right. Right. And I'm like, you're like in your but in your mind, like you've had you have a higher investment level for this princess and you're like. I don't want anything yeah, to go like, wrong with this scene. This is not the time that I am willing to allow there to be complications because this relationship between our characters is super important to me. And exactly. And not worth, like, messing with for a, a five-minute gag. Yeah. It, exactly. So in this case, you would then buy it off. Like, which, nope. which from the GM side... Um, and, and I actually, this is just as we're going off script here, from the GM side, there is actually an indication that if a player is willing to buy off a compel when they normally don't, yeah, that there's they something care. important going on here, yeah, right? So change your tact, and actually, this is GM advice, change your tact and play into the scene for the player. Yeah, yeah. Because they now, obviously are very invested. <laughs> right. Now, if they were going for the rom-com thing, right, like, then maybe they would have taken the compel to the sweaty hands thing, right, and, like, just done something, like, looked a little shy or foolish, and then, like, you would play that up as, like, it was cute, adorable. Right. Or had them make a check or something to kind of keep the date going. Yep. Okay. Yep. But, again, going back to your point before we transition out of player advice, it is really okay sometimes to say no. Sometimes. Sometimes. Not right. all the time. If you say no all like, the time, like, just go play a different game. You obviously correct. aren't super into just, transactional complications, and that's fine. But, like, totally fine. It, it messes with the economy of games that have them if you just try to say no all the time. They are built yep. to have them, so say no when you need to. You got it. Say yes when you can. Anyway, uh, yeah, so tell us about transactional complications as a GM. Sure. So as a GM, uh, you're going to be the primary initiator of transactional complications. All right, everybody, settle down, you fate heads. <laughs> the exception, of course, being the self-compelling fate. And I think now there is some sort of player intrusion uh, in the new version of Cypher. So Ooh, ease cool. up. Yeah. Ease up, everybody. <laughs> All right. So 
as primary, the GM, not singular. <laughs> correct. Primary initiator <laughs> of transactional complications. Thank you. All right. So here's a few things about using that power wisely, right? First one is um, to kind of go with your first one. Uh, the first one is build trust, yes. right? If players are going to trust you, do some trustworthy shit first. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, build trust by um, using your first compels not in high tense situations, but like in in like lower tension situations where you can kind of show the compel, but the stakes aren't so high. Right. So instead of like the the massive climax scene with the Baron, you might do your first compel um, of the can't keep, you know, my big mouth shut might just be in like a tavern. Right. Where the difference is like some people are going to look at them funny, but like. You know, they're not going to screw up the entire, you know, negotiation. negotiation. Yep, absolutely. Right. Just do like do some of those so that the players actually get used to it and kind of understand um, like what it's for. Yeah. Because those low stakes situations, uh, one, they'll they'll more than likely take the compel. Yep. And two, you'll all get kind of used to um, this transaction and kind of get into it. And then after they've gotten some comfort and, and they've earned some trust, then is when you slide a fate point across the table mm -hmm. during the big negotiation when one of them's like, oh, when the player's like, oh, damn, of course I'm going to take this. Yeah, like, oh, right? boy, let's see what happens. Because that, that, that should be the feeling of a compel, right? Like a yes. There should be some let's, laughing, right? Let's, like, let's, yes, let's see how this goes, right? That's right. usually my I, feeling as I take a compel. I, I usually have that one. I usually have the, oh, no. Like, like, oh, no. No, not his big yes. stupid mouth. But right? Yes, like, give yeah. me the coin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. My, my next tip is do not tempt into failure. Like this is my scripture, right? Do not tempt into failure, but rather... No. Um, <laughs> all right. Do not do not tempt like into I failure. I feel start singing something religious and choral. Prof I summon Professor Fox. Professor Fox will finish yeah, the other she, half of the slide. Yeah, she would another. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, do not tempt into failure. So when you're using a compel, do not make the acceptance of the compel uh, either an automatic failure or undoing something that the players have been trying to achieve. Right. Right. Like, don't... <laughs> Uh, don't be like, haha, you took the compel, you're screwed. Yep. Which is kind of what we were talking about earlier, too, in terms of trusting the GM not to do that. Like, hey, GMs, don't do that. Right. So this would be like, you know, if you've confronted the Baron about the food in his teeth, you know, either directly or there's a bunch of whispering behind, you know, they might have to do an etiquette check or something, right, to, to overcome that complication that's been inserted or, or the difficulty of the next role might increase, right? Get, you, have you have to pass the etiquette, the etiquette check, check or, or it's going to be harder the difficulty for goes, you to actually right. just roll the next negotiation check. Correct. Because the etiquette check means that you've somehow managed to, after you blurted it out, to, you've managed yeah. to parse it. You've, you've managed to parse the, the social faux pas yeah. In, um, into correctly. something. Yeah. 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 Yes. All right. Cool. Moving on. Uh, the next bit of advice is read the beats. Uh, which means that understand where you are in your story uh, before you introduce a potential complication. So have you used have you used complication recently? Is this beat a downbeat and doesn't actually doesn't need any further complications? Like just there are times and places. There's times and places for when to use a complication. My last bit of advice will be what kind of complication, but there are times and places to use complications. And so kind of read, read your narrative to know where to put them in there. They don't go everywhere. And finally, the fourth tip, only when it was funny. And what we mean by this is when you are going to use a complication. So when a beat is when the beat is correct for using one, you make your complication count, right? So complications should make scenes more tense, more dramatic. They should make them funnier, something like that, right? The, the, don't just do it for the sake of doing it. Um, do it because, do it because both 
failing whatever's going to happen because of this complication or passing is going to be interesting. Yeah. Right? So insulting the Baron in the middle of the negotiation is going to be tense because you're going to now have to talk your way out of this yes. insult. But again, following the thing about do not tempt into failure, insulting the Baron about the thing in his teeth does not end the negotiation. The Baron does not immediately arrest you and throw you no. in jail. Right? Just the, make but it you more do tense. now have yeah. to Right, you do now have to do more work if you fail the etiquette check um, to close this uh, negotiation. Otherwise, the Baron's probably going to get more out of the deal or you're going to have to give up more stuff yes. or whatever. So, yeah. So, you do it when you do it when it counts. Yep. All right, cool. That's our take on how to best use transactional complications. Hopefully, that helps you better utilize them and make your games more fun. And now... I'm going to use this last fate point to compel Senda to get to the closing of the show by asking her to talk about another show on the Misdirected Mark Network. Is that one of my aspects that I talk about the next show on the Misdirected Mark Network? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, well, on Bone, Stone, and Obsidian, Wayne and Robert take monthly deep dives into the Dark Sun setting and discuss it across all of the editions of D&D. Woo! Woo! Say, Senda, where can people reach us on the internets? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us in the Misdirected Mark forums, or you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. And Phil, once they find us in one of those places, what can they do with that information? Well, much like John did uh, over on in the forums, uh, drop us a topic. Uh, we love to do the shows about the things that you love to hear. Uh, we pride ourselves on like about a 97%... Um, 97% of all of our topics come from you all. So we really love that. It's really fun to kind of just, it's fun for me when a topic comes rolling in or a question comes rolling in to jump on it and be like, oh, this is going to be a show. I got it. I got it. I know what to do. Um, so I really dig that. So please keep sending us uh, more uh, topics uh, because otherwise we're going to have to make up our own. And then what you're really going to get is uh, more talk about bread ditch lilies. and ditch bread? lilies. Ditch lilies. They don't know about probably. the bread yet, though. They don't know oh. about the bread because they were listening to this linearly. Oh, right. Well, you're <laughs> going to find out about the bread in just a couple of minutes. Yes. So we're going to have to talk more <laughs> about bread uh, and the ditch lilies if you don't keep sending us topics. So uh, consider that. If you like what we do here elsewhere on the Mistrected Mark Network, please support our Patreon campaign. Our Patreon campaign is very important. It keeps the lights on. It keeps us doing what we're uh, doing, which hopefully you love because we love it as well. Patrons get all sorts of cool things, access to our Slack room, the bonus outtakes from this show, the Mistrected Mark after show, and a whole bunch of other goodies. Uh, we also like to do some shout outs to our patrons. And tonight we shout out to PK Sullivan, the Royal Rocketeer, which is really funny because we're talking about fate compels tonight. I know. I thought I figured it must have been intentional. No, not intentional. It's just where we oh. landed on the list. So uh, huh. the fates have it. They do. Um, I, did, I, I I went and bought that 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 book, uh, the the Worlds of Fate book that had Royal the Rocketeers the three Rocketeers in it specifically so that I would have it when they were like, we're clearing out our warehouse. I was like, no, I must have a copy. Awesome. 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 Anyway, that was way too much information. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Zach <laughs> Goins. Thank you very much. And uh, secret weapon of the misdirected Mark drew Smith um, and uh, all around awesome player. If you ever get a chance to play at a game with drew Smith at your table, uh, you it, drew will not disappoint. Every time I've played a game with drew, uh, every one of his characters have been completely memorable. Um, and I've loved them all very much. So thank you again, Drew, for your support. Senda, there's a thing people can do if they are not able to support the podcast uh, Patreon, which is totally fine, um, or already supporting it. There's still a little something more they could do. That thing is super important because, as we like to say, once you start listening to us, you will fall in love with us. Is we know that for now? sure. Yeah. Is this part of the pattern now? Yeah, this is part of the pattern. This is this is the third time. Yeah, once, <laughs> once you listen to us, you will fall in love with us. We guarantee it. <laughs> so what we need help with is getting more people to listen to us. And there is a way to do that. What is that way, Senda? Well, you can leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Every new review we get really does actually help new people find the show, which is pretty awesome. And it makes us feel super happy and giddy inside like pandas with delicious bamboo who just roll out of trees because they don't even care. And if you leave it somewhere that's not the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, um... We probably won't see it because there's too many places for it to be. So you can drop us a note somewhere. We really do actually love to read them. Um, and we will do our best to go find them. But also, like, if you tell us it's there, we'll be really happy. 
Yeah, uh, you know, also, like, just go tell your friends. Like, just, you know, show up to game I mean, day. You could just, yeah, just be show like, up to game day and be like, have you guys ever listened to Pandas Talk Games? Because holy shit, these guys are hilarious and super smart. Wow, hashtag humble frank. <laughs> anyway. And, okay. That's and, our thing. End of the show. End of the show. Say, Senda, show me how you're going to compel one of your players in your next game. Yeah. This show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Bloopy. Click, 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 says the waveform. Click, click, goes the waveform. Clang, clang, goes the bell. Uh, I seem a little <laughs> bit lower than I want to be. I'm just going to pull that recording volume up, and I like those waveforms a lot better. Okay. Bloop. So Phil has never made bread in a bread machine. I really haven't. And but... I, I guess that's like not probably that weird, except that like I literally grew up in a house where for a very long time we made all of our own bread in a bread machine. I, I, I would, I would, I would like to do that. Like I like bread. <laughs> like I would I totally like bread. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting. So, so what I was, what I, so it's like, I, I will say generally, right? Because I, I don't, I, I, these are just the bread machines that I personally sure, experienced. Sure. So there's like a long, tall pan. Okay, sure. Right. And, and so it's like four, for all four sides, but like, <clears throat> it's all, it's tall instead of like loaf shape. Well, sure. Right? Because it's like a relatively small, small profile right, so machine. That you, put it into the thing yeah, yeah. right um so you just you just you literally just like put in you put in your liquids and you put in your flour and then usually there's like a little thingy at the top so that it can release the yeast in when it feels that everything is the correct sure, temperature okay. and has been mixed and then it kneads it all in together and then it bakes it and then you pull it out and then you have magic bread uh it seems a uh, brilliant it's amazing it takes about four hours and then you just have magic bread. But it takes about, I don't know, 10 minutes to dump the stuff in to the bread machine. And then you have, like, fresh bread. So last night I was like, <coughs> ugh, I have these little bread books on my shelf that I completely forgot about. And they're specifically bread machine books. And the recipe that I keep using in my bread machine right now is not a bread machine recipe. It comes out great, but I have to cut the recipe in half because it's not actually sized the right way for a bread plus machine. On right? top of that, you, plus on top of that, you live in Denver. So no, no, baking, well, no baking works this is correctly where it gets tricky. anyway, right? Right. So like the thing about living in Denver is that the yeast actually rises too fast and then it falls, right? So I have all sorts of things where I mess with stuff like recipes for, for bread frequently call for like warm water and I'm always using ice cold water. Like I'm doing everything I can to like just maybe make the yeast not react quite as quickly. Slow right? down the so yeast kinetics a, is what you're saying. A little bit more salt cold water I'm, right I'm honestly like i'm surprised with all that, that your machine doesn't know elevation and knows to adjust uh, the know, yeast accordingly the thing with the bread machine is like i just put it in and i walk away right like this is when i make bread like myself by hand i do a bunch of adjustments Bloop. so i i went and i was like sweet and there's like this delicious looking recipe in one of these little books right for like a a, a maple syrup whole wheat loaf yeah that sounds like, delicious oh. That sounds fantastic. Cool. Let's do it. And so, um, and the cool thing about that bread machine book is because it's for bread machines, it has like three different sizes of bread because you have to make the right size loaf. Like you can make a smaller loaf, but you can't make a bigger loaf because it'll like ooze everywhere on the inside and bad. Um, don't do it. Bloop. So I did the medium one and it was like cool. And I put everything in and like whole wheat is always harder. Um, so I was like, this is probably not going to rise as much. But it should still be, like, okay, right? Like, when I opened the lid this morning, and the house smelled amazing, because that's the other thing about this, right, is that your house smells like baking bread, and it smelled amazing. And we all walked into the kitchen this morning like, yes, this bread smells amazing. And we walk into the kitchen this morning and I'm like, yes, I'm just going to slice off a piece of this fantastic bread and I'll put like my pumpkin spread on it or peanut butter or whatever. And that's my breakfast. And I'm so excited. And I open the lid on the bread machine 
And instead of a loaf, there is a like a, a blobby ball of dough Uh-oh. at the bottom of the pan that's just been baked. Like, it didn't rise at all. It didn't rise to the point that I was like, did it actually, did the mechanism that adds the yeast break? Is there still yeast in the top? Like, I actually checked. I was like, what, what happened? Because it did not rise at all. Or it had already risen so much that when it ran the last, like, cycle of beating it down, it never came back. <laughs> like, I don't know what happened. It's, I mean, that's the problem with, like, the, you know, doing it in a bread machine. Like, it went for four hours and, like, I have no idea at what point it died. But I had a very delicious smelling, it wasn't even a hockey puck because it hadn't even expanded to fill the entire bottom of the pan. It was just, like... (laughs) Was it edible or did you just have to toss it? I mean, it was edible, but it was, like, not sliceable or, like, sandwichable. It was, it was dense is... (laughs) I mean, unleavened bread yeah but usually with that amount of flour and stuff instead you end up with like baking soda and stuff in there to make that shit rise Bloop. i i've only baked uh, <laughs> bread once um i made uh, uh i made coffee can beer bread oh beer bread is is cool yes um, but in a coffee can but why did you make it in a coffee can yes because we were in fifth grade Oh, okay. <laughs> we were in fifth grade, and it was a fifth grade project. So, so first of all, I, I, so first of all, I'm taking it by the look on your face that you are not unfamiliar with the coffee can. I there, no, I know what a coffee can is. I used to make candles in them. Okay, perfect. So, um, because because they're not actually like that common it's anymore, right? They like, aren't anymore. No, no, because people, you just get like a vacuum brick of your right, right, right. right. It's probably so seals better. We all had to bring a coffee can to school. Right, and then um, we made up the batter as a class, and then we like all dispensed our like we like they like, let you have beer. The teacher in was fifth there. Grade. The teacher was supervising. Like okay. the teacher put the beer in, and we all went ooh, right? Like <laughs> somebody pretended to drink it and got in trouble, right? Like all of that right. stuff. Um, right, and then um, we made um, beer bread, and we got to like, and then they they took the cans away. And like took them to the kitchen or something, and in like the big industrial oven, they cooked them all, and then um, and then brought them back to us. So like and we then all you got to eat them, and then we got to eat them, which was like amazing, delicious. Yes, because beer because beer bread is um, beer bread's fantastic. And it is fantastic. I mean, I think I even like it's it's and it's so it's so easy. Bloop. I think it's what is it like. It's one can of beer and three cups of self-rising flour and like some salt. Sure, right. I'm just going to agree with you. Although I am looking at the, I am looking at a recipe for it. Bloop. Thank you. Meow. I know. I went to look at the notes. (laughs) When we meow, we're about to start the show. You don't talk again. Wednesdays, we we meow. One more time with feeling. Bum, bum. Good done. Bloop. And welcome to an episode of Pandas Talking Games. I'm one of your hosts with all the fate points, Phil. And I am your other host, I guess, with all of the compels? <laughs> I was going to say with all the trouble aspects, but sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Senda. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> Let's try that again. Wow, fail. <laughs> you, 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 you. We don't write these tele- in. You telegraphed we, this. Just so people, Damn just it. so people know, we don't write these in, and I often make them up as I'm saying them. You make it up as you're saying it, and then you leave me to try and figure out what you mean. Yes, the like other figure out what the <laughs> other half of this is, right? Okay. Let's try it again. This time with a little feeling. All right, a little more feeling. That's my literally know, my next it's about bullet being point. Funny. That's okay. I said when, <laughs> not how. And finally, the fourth tip. <laughs> Only when it was funny. Um, Bloop. which is what you were trying to say when you were trying to steal I'm, my I last wasn't, point. I wasn't. I wasn't. I don't. I'm. I'm a very nice person. I don't steal. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Bloop. 
You know what? Here you know we what? go again. All okay. Like, like, okay. All the years okay. of being humble have <laughs> have have kept us at a modest set of numbers. I'm just putting it on top here. Like we're pretty awesome at this. So um, if people want to listen, you should listen. And listen, if you're gaming and you're listening to this, like this is like a free service. If you throw questions at us, like there's a good chance you're getting an episode. Like we'll solve problems. Bloop. Show me what Show you me got. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. Show, Show me, me what, you what you got. Show me what you got. Yeah, I'm going on. A, this is my new tack now. This is this is, new ta- I mean, sure, sure, cool. This is my. This is my. Listen, we, if you if you listen we, to us, you will love us. We we gotta end the show though because we yeah, gotta go record the B show. We got B-show. work to do. We got B okay. show. B show okay. coming up. Say goodbye. Right. Bye. Bye. Stop. <laughs>